surprised me. It's been a terrific, terrific symposium so far, really exciting. I'm especially pleased to follow Leah's talk, which has introduced uh, many of the issues that we'll, we'll build on today as we look towards uh, going from understanding to treating uh, disorders related to sub, uh, subcortical structures. So I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease, which many of you will be familiar with, and then introduce a disorder known as progressive supranuclear palsy that Leah mentioned, but you're probably less familiar with. I'm going to talk about apathy and impulsivity in that context, and then lead on to a series of studies looking at the role of the subthalamic nucleus in the context of frontostriatal uh, connectivity, or so, uh, front, uh, basal ganglia connectivity, and then move to the locus ceruleus uh, and uh, show some of our recent data, some of which is published, some unpublished, with 70 imaging in combination with atomoxetine. So Parkinson's disease, many of you will be familiar with. It's usually def defined through its motor symptoms, but actually it's all have almost as ubiquitous cognitive and behavioral sleep and autonomic changes. But of particular interest today is this combination of apathy and impulsivity. But I'm, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, with, with Parkinson's disease. Less familiar will be progressive supranuclear palsy, um, once known as steele richard Oslovsky syndrome, uh, co-described by this gentleman here in the middle, uh, John Steele, in the early 60s, defined by its uh, early falls, uh, akinetic rigidity or Parkinsonism in a broader sense, change in eye movements, and a cognitive syndrome. But important today is that this illness also causes severe and profound apathy and often impulsivity with it. Um, and uh, the, the, the members of my team here, shown with John Steele, are really the, uh, going to be showing a lot of their work in the next half an hour. So I talk about apathy and that impulsivity, and one thing to really bring home is just how bad they are for your prognosis as a patient. So in the large studies, uh, the, the key papers there in the east of England, we measured a range of cognitive and behavioural features, and what I'm going to call challenging behaviours, which is the combination of apathy and impulsivity. Um, we're very, we're very common. There's a, a range. Each dot on this chart represents an individual patient uh, out of about 350 patients. This is from a PCA that extracted the severity of challenging behaviours. Uh, patients here on the left in red have frontotemporal dementia defined by apathy and impulsivity. Around half of the patients with PSP have the expression of these features to the same degree and severity as patients with frontotemporal dementia on top of their motor disorders. And if we take patients uh, from this study and we track them over time and look at their survival, I could show survival to death, but here I'm showing survival to a nursing home or death, so independent survival. If we look at the three groups, high, middle and low levels of these challenging behaviours, uh, we see that on average there's around a year to 18 month difference in the time to death or nursing home. So that's a very profound effect on survival. Now, some of you may have noticed I'm talking about apathy and impulsivity as, as a phrase, as a set phrase. Um, and that may, may be a surprise. Many of you might think of apathy and impulsivity as two ends of a spectrum. Perhaps in the lay sense, apathy is about uh, doing things too slowly, not doing enough, too little. And in the literature, this has been associated with a hypodopaminergic state. In contrast, impulsivity, where in the lay sense, it's about doing, being too quick, doing too much. Uh, and again, in the literature, has often been associated with a hyper-increased dopaminergic state. And it's easy to understand sort of where this has come from, the idea of impulsivity too much. It's maybe related to uh, uh, excess reward. And it's very you know, foundational work uh, over, over the last two decades around the dopaminergic basis of reward control disorders. So it's easy to see where this hyper-dopaminergic story derives from. And equally, the hypodopaminergic story of apathy uh, comes from really elegant experimental work, looking, for example, at dopamine sensitivity following lesions in the basal ganglia, and a nice review here by Masood Hussain on the role of dopamine in, in apathy. So just to bear this dopaminergic story uh, is there, but it has problems. And the problem is largely because it encourages you to think of apathy and impulsivity as opposite ends of extreme, a kind of Jekyll and Hyde, people who know that, uh, uh, that, that story. Um, and there's problems with this, and it's actually it's wrong. These are not opposite ends of a single domain or spectrum. <laughs> and the simplest way, perhaps, to understand that is to see the data um, here from uh, disorders associated with frontotemporal lobe degeneration, but it's also nicely set out in the Masuda Sain's paper in Brain last summer in Parkinson's disease. 
that people who are more apathetic are also more impulsive and vice versa. So these go positively together. These aren't opposite ends of a spectrum, but they're positively correlated. So how has this state of affairs come about? Well, I think it's true that stimulating a dopaminergic system can reverse experimentally induced deficits in reward, more sensitivity, um, but that's a very long way from understanding the nature of diseases as they arrive uh, from uh, degeneration and natural causes. And if you look across the clinical trials evidence, so there really is a lack of evidence for the dopaminergic uh, uh, treatments of, of apathy. And where there are uh, reports, they're small, open label, or they haven't had apathy as a primary outcome. Um, and even where effects are observed, the drugs not only affect dopamine, but also noradrenergic system. Drugs like Ritalin, methylphenidate, which is a noradrenergic and dopaminergic substrate. So we need to rethink and have a new approach to the, uh, uh, the pharmacological basis of apathy and impulsivity. And it brings me to the noradrenergic systems, again, to, to pick up on, on Leah's talk. And almost all, all of the, uh, the brain's noradrenergic system derives from the locus cerulis in the brain stem. Um, seen here. If you want to know the size of it, imagine just taking two small sticks of spaghetti as shown here, and that's about the locus cerulius. Uh, it's small and it's thin. It's difficult to, to image and examine uh, in vivo. But if we look in, for example, Parkinson's disease, uh, and we look at neuronal numbers, uh, or we look at uh, biochemical assays of norepinephrine, we could also uh, use a PET uh, of norepinephrine uptake. There's a, we can see a very marked impact of Parkinson's disease on the locus cerulis, on these noradrenergic cells. And we see something similar in progressive supranuclear slices through the, uh, the brainstem, uh, through the pons here. And that little black dot there, that's black because of neuromelanin in the cells of the locus cerulis. If we look at a patient with PSP, uh, it's gone. It just, you, you can't see it. And if we, if we look under the microscope, uh, we can see here in that region, each black dot is a noradrenergic cell in a healthy control participant, and you can just see how sparse they are in PSP. And to put some numbers on this, we can look across uh, a group of patients with PSP, and on average, there's a 50% reduction uh, in the numbers of, of noradrenergic neurons in the locus cerulis. And that reduction correlates with disease severity, adjusting for the time from the last assessment to the time of death in brain donation. So profound effects of both diseases on the locus cerulius. So this brings to mind uh, the potential perhaps of the noradrenergic therapeutic strategies, uh, both for PD and for PSP. Uh, and that's what I'm going to come on to in the rest of the talk. And a quick digression is if there's any uh, students or uh, early career researchers out there, um, hang on in there. Uh, I first began working on the locus cerulius uh, many years ago. My very first paper as an undergraduate was on the noradrenergic alpha antagonist isozoxan on cognitive flexibility uh, here 25 years ago. So hang on in there. Um, it took a little while before I was in a position uh, to really translate this to the clinic not just in, in, the, in the rats, but to bring it to clinic. And over the last 10 years, we've run a series of studies using a drug called atomoxetine. This is a noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor. So enhancing the efficacy and duration of noradrenaline after it's been released. And I'm gonna show some highlights of the series of studies, but one of the recurrent features is that whilst it improves impulsivity in some participants with PSP uh, and Parkinson's disease, it doesn't do so in everybody. So it immediately uh, puts pressure on us to think about stratified or personalized medicine, trying to identify and predict who is likely to respond to the treatment. So one of the highlights picking here from some data by, by Zheng Yi, who studied a stop signal task, so a task of response inhibition, where the impulsivity can be measured in terms of the stop signal reaction time. In healthy controls, there's widespread activation, and in patients with Parkinson's disease, we see reductions in the lateral prefrontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex, the pre-SMA. So this is an fMRI study. We repeat this on and off atomoxetine versus placebo. And I'm gonna highlight this difference here in these two regions, you'll see why in a moment. But the key thing was that with atomoxetine, we restored activation in the inferior gyrus at a group level. But notice how the effect, this change inactivation was a function of disease severity, measured here with the UBDRS. So we can say that the frontal cortical activation inhibition 
is reduced in Parkinson's disease that may contribute to, to impulsivity. But at least in those with relatively more severe disease, the drug atomoxidine can restore the activation. Now that's not the same as restoring behavior. And to understand the impact on behavior, we need to think about the onward connections of that prefrontal cortex through the basal ganglia and subcortical structures uh, and, and that uh, the effect, efficacy of those connections in order to change behavior. And so it's the work of Charlotte Ray, who showed in two, two studies, one is in healthy subjects, uh, that the degree of impulsivity measured by the stop signal reaction time task was a function of the integrity of those frontostriatal tracts, specifically the mean fractional anisotropy on the pathways from the pre-SMA coming down here through into the basal ganglia or from that right infrafrontal gyrus. And you can see the plots here looking at this, those correlations. Further, when we looked at the patients with Parkinson's disease, we showed that the behavioral in inhibition improvement that we saw, so the change, delta SSRT, the change in the stop signal reaction time task was proportional to the fractional anisotropy in the homologous frontostriatal pathways. Now, we don't know exactly where these terminate, but it's very encouraging to see or exciting to see that there was a, a, a frontostriatal connectivity seemed to determine whether that cortical activation with atomoxidine was transformed into a behavioral benefit. But let's just think a little bit more about what you need to control what you're doing, how to make the right decisions about what to do and what not to do. Well, ultimately, you need to affect the outputs of the motor cortex uh, in, into all your physical behaviors. We'll see that, that the brakes are on really through the subthalamic nucleus and uh, you see, I think uh, several of these speakers uh, mentioned here have done seminal work to, uh, to outline the functions of the subthalamic nucleus. But that is uh, responding to inputs from the, either the pre-SMA, uh, which has been implicated in selection and inhibition of action, and the inferior frontal gyrus, um, where there's a you know, mounting evidence for its role in inhibition and to some extent perhaps orienting to, to salient events leading to inhibition. So these, these four areas are acting concert. I'm going to think of them as a network. And as a network. What we then want to do is using a method called dynamic causal modeling is to understand the organization of the network and its parameters. So we use dynamic causal modeling here with fMRI to understand that stopping network. And <coughs> uh, essentially after searching over a, a wide range of potential model architectures, uh, the, the most likely model looked like this, in which both the pre-SMA and the infrafrontal gyrus were interconnected. And I'll return to that when we talk about the role of the locus ceruleus in imaging later on. So listen out for that SMA to IFG connectivity. But they were interacting in their projections to the subthalamic nucleus. So there's a positive synergy between these two uh, prefrontal to subthalamic projections. And the specific data with this, that the interaction, I'm expressing here on the y-axis, is the effect of the IFG projection modifying the influence of the pre-SMA and subthalamic nucleus. That interaction between these descending tracks correlated with the behavior. So those with a strong modifying effect of the infrafrontal gyrus were less impulsive. You see the correlation here. Now let's carry that forward to the clinical context in our patients who are either on atomoxidine or placebo, we can say, how does that the drug, the noradrenergic drug atomoxidine, restore the connectivity and affect the connectivity through to the subthalamic nucleus? And the answer was there was an effect, there was an effective drug. So the atomoxidine, atomoxidine changed the connectivity from the inferior gyrus to the subthalamic nucleus, but it did so as a function again of disease severity. There's a significant positive correlation here. So the effect of a drug on the brain depends on the state of the brain into which it's being applied. And it's really important we understand that as we think about tailoring individual medicine. And we don't assume that there's a one drug fits all situation. So it puts the emphasis on individualized treatments and understanding individual differences. And this brings us back to looking in more detail about what's happening in the source of that noradrenaline in the locus ceruleus. So since we began this work, there have been huge advances in uh, MRI, structural MRI. And we've been working with the 7T MRI with uh, um, magnetization transfer sequences, uh, trying to image this uh, thin elongated nucleus. And with the, this is uh, work from Katarina Brewer and uh, Ron Yi shown here. If we look in healthy subjects, 
we can see with these sequences, this little white dot here in axial slice or this little white stripe. This is like those two short sticks of spaghetti I showed you in the opening slides. Exquisite imaging and intensity of the locus cerebris based on the new melanin content in noradrenergic neurons. So we'll just highlight that this, this work is now published and all of the source data that's gone into this work is available, uh, links through the paper here. So let's think about the locus aurelius uh, in healthy aging initially. So I'm drawing on work which is, was acquired with three Tesla MT sequence, MT sensitive sequence, um, but using the atlas to extract and localize the locus aurelius data it's from the CAMCAN study. So we wanted to adjust for age and sex and then think about individual variability with respect to age and sex matched peers. So whether for your age, if you're higher or lower in that locus aurelius contrast, the measure of the integrity of locus aurelius, how does that affect behavior? And there was a clear effect that your stop signal reaction time, this measure of impulse control, impulsivity, varied with the locus aurelius contrast and did so more with age. And actually, it, the effect of that SSRT correlated with the connectivity between the pre SMA and the IFG on uh, resting state uh, fMRI. So we can start trying to understand how does the locus aurelius interact with these cortical regions that are so important for controlling behavior. And we're going to build a model to say if the locus aurelius is influencing your stop signal action time task, what mediates that? So this is not published work, but it's all set and it'll hopefully be submitted shortly, but this is all part of a pre-registered open science framework analysis. Uh, so I'm happy to share the result at this point, which is that the impact of the locus aurelius on the behavior is at least in part mediated by its control of the connectivity between IFG and pre-SMA. Okay. So the locus aurelius is regulating cortical cortical interactions in a way to govern behavioral control. So let's come back with that in mind and think about those two diseases, Parkinson's disease and PSP. So showing here, this is the, the quality of images we obtained with uh, healthy subjects. If we look at healthy older subjects, I hope you can see here those little white dots Okay, very clear to see the locus aurelius. It's a bit hazier in Parkinson's, and I'm impressed if you can see it here in PSP. Um, you know, it, if we look more, sorry, if we look more formally, slice-wise, looking from the rostral to the caudal slices, so a rostral on the right-hand side here, moving back caudally, compared to in grey, healthy age match controls in both Parkinson's disease in red and in PSP in blue, we see a reduction in both the contrast and the volume particularly in this caudal aspect, okay, a clear difference. And if we can start with that comparing the groups uh, on a voxel-wise basis, we can see here the caudal degeneration or caudal signal change between patients and healthy controls. We can also see that the structural changes that we can detect with the, with the MRI 7T in PSP and Parkinson's disease also correlates with global cognition. These are the voxel-wise correlations with the MOCA, a global screening test for cognition, or here with uh, the um, Starxine apathy screening tool. So the patients who have a more degenerate uh, locus aurelius have worse cognition and more apathy. Now let's bring this back to uh, treatment studies, trying to target the right patients. So the rest of these studies are comparing patients uh, on atomoxidine 40 milligrams uh, versus placebo. It's all randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, of course. Um, and we're going to come back to apathy. I'd rather be focused on uh, impulsivity and the stop signal task in the last few minutes, but I'm going to turn to apathy. And I wanted, if you remember, to get away from this idea that it's a simple dopamine reward mediated disorder uh, or deficit. And some very elegant work by Frank Hedsimans, uh, who might even be on, on, on the call, I hope, has shown by using a novel, uh, effortful, force mediated, rewarded vision motor task we can estimate the extent to which an individual represents the precision of what they expect the outcome of their actions to be. Okay. So it's not just about high or low reward or how accurate or inaccurate they are, but it's the precision with which that information is represented. That method is described here. It's too complicated and afraid for this rather compressed talk, but it's a very elegant method he, he developed. And what we see is that this precision on the prior, this is the precision the expectation of the outcome of your actions correlates with apathy. 
did so in young healthy adults uh, using um, Pseudosane's uh, African Motivation Index. It does so here with older adults uh, with the uh, Africa scale. What was very pleasing was we then come back and look at the relationship between this precision variable, so a cognitive mechanism, if you like, for apathy in relation to the locus ceruleus uh, contrast to noise. And the effect of the drug atomoxetine to improve or to worsen the, your, the representation of the precision of your outcomes correlated with the locus ceruleus. And this speaks to a much broader literature, perhaps on the role of the noradrenergic system in, in uh, signal control theory and in gating information in the cortical representations. And we would say here that it's influencing the precision with which you're representing the outcomes of your actions. And that is critical for your motivation and apathy if it's poorly represented. So we're going to come back and say, what about this effect of the drug atomoxity? Well, not only was the effect of the drug on these precisions a function of your contrast to noise, but that itself varied depending on how apathetic you were. So a slightly complex three-way interaction to describe, but I think the simplest way of putting it is that the importance of your baseline locus ceruleus integrity for the response to the drug, it increases the more apathetic you are. So we're then trying to tailor or individualize a therapy based perhaps on the state of your cognition, how apathetic you are, the state of your brain, your locus ruleus integrity, in order to guide a treatment expectation. So, yeah, I think as I probably summarized here, the noradrenergic enhancement in Parkinson's disease restored that key mechanism of goal-directed behavior, the precision of the representation of outcomes according to the state of the locus ruleus and the degree of apathy. Now, apathy and impulsivity, you remember having emphasized a few minutes ago, are highly correlated. So if we look also, uh, just as a brief summary in these patients, we say, what about the effect of atomoxetine on this um, stop signal reaction time task? Well, it makes some people better, it makes some people worse. But those that it improved by shortening the stop signal reaction time task were those who had a degenerate locus ceruleus. In other words, if you have Parkinson's disease and you have a, a degenerate locus ceruleus, you appear to be the person who is likely to benefit from atomoxetine. Just to identify that, that, that um, sort of in, in, interaction sink in. If you are earlier mild and have an intact locus ceruleus, we can even make things worse. It's clearly not somebody to treat. So over the last 25 minutes, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm just going to bring this to, to a summary of the next couple of slides. I, I started out by emphasizing that apathy and impulsivity are positively correlated. We showed how inhibitory control relates to this interaction between the pre-SOA and the infrafrontal gyrus and their mutual connectivity to the subthalamic nucleus. And I then showed in healthy older adults from 50 to 80 that that connectivity between the IFG and the pre-SMA appears to mediate a contribution of the locus ceruleus integrity to behavioral control. Uh, yes, oh sorry, yes, and that in, um, uh, and that in uh, the stop signal task, the degree of impulsivity, these outcome priors that uh, also relate directly to the stop signal, the um, integrity of your locus ceruleus. So now, now bringing that back to the, the clinical domain, we saw on the way that in both Parkinson's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy, there's severe damage to the locus ceruleus, and we saw that with the uh, quantitative um, uh, so anatomic post-mortem with stereology. There's also neurochemical evidence for that. And I showed how advances in imaging with 70 allow us to also quantify in vivo and reveal these early changes in the locus ceruleus in patients with PSP. We can take this forward then to try and individualize and test noradrenergic treatment candidates. And I focused on atomoxygen and alternatives trying to individualize predictions about your response for treating apathy and, and, and uh, impulsivity. But whether they work seems to depend on your connectivity from the cortex to the subthalamic nucleus and the integrity of the locus ceruleus. And I'm very pleased that we're taking this forward now into a new trial called NORAPS, which is a, a noradrenergic trial uh, a, uh, using atomoxetine to try and treat apathy and impulsivity as a phase two trial in progressive supranuclear palsy. So uh, thank you for listening. I'm extremely grateful. I've got a fantastic team at the Centre for Across Europe.
and I focus the people in bold of those whose work is most directly related to the, the work uh, I presented today, but there really is a, a lot of extra work from others behind the scenes. I'd like to thank them also. Thank you for listening. And thank you very much for the for the great talk.